Hi, I'm Dr. Marty Goldstein, and my presentation today is entitled, Some Fundamentals of Health and Disease. What is disease, and does it actually have a purpose? It's actually dis-ease, an uneasiness about the body. And why is it here? What is itis? Itis is Latin for inflammation. The body creates inflammation in the process of healing. The body creates inflammation in the process of detoxification. And inflammation creates signs or symptoms of dis-ease. And we may not necessarily want to suppress this with chemicals or drugs. I wrote a book 20 years ago. It's called The Nature of Animal Healing. And one of the most vital chapters in the book is chapter 6 called The Healing Crisis. Herring's Law of Cure dates back to 1875. The main focus of chapter 6, the law states... All cure starts from within out, from the head down, in reverse order as symptoms have appeared. In order to get well, the patient must go through the crisis. Expect it, look for it, and actually work towards it. In the beginning of my book, I laid down the fundamental principles of natural healing. And here they are. Disease is an absence of health and vice versa. Health is an absence of disease, but health was here first. Disease is a process used by nature in an attempt to get itself healthy. Degenerative disease is not caused by nature. It's an aberration of nature caused mostly by, in my opinion, man. Cancer, simplistically put, is nothing more than a severe aberration of nature manifested in and by the body. Sickness is an excuse to get healthy. You all heard this one. Don't mess with Mother Nature. The immune system functions maximally and at peak efficiency in its totally unaltered state. We don't have to artificially stimulate or enhance the immune system because every action has an equal and opposite reaction. So by artificially stimulating the immune system, something else in the immune system is going to start to decline and fail. The degree to which we have to work towards health is directly proportional to the amount we messed it up in the first place. Health is simple. How do you heal a cut? Sign on to Google? No. Nature knows how to heal that cut. Disease and the entire medical establishment brings in complexity because we that it's just a sign of how we messed it up. Nature uses disease to establish balance. Only when our bodies are out of balance are we subject to disease. Homeostasis, the ability of an organism or cell to maintain internal equilibrium by adjusting its physiological processes. And when the body does that to go and reestablish homeostasis, it creates signs or symptoms of, of illness or disease. And very important, in a holistic perspective, there is no such thing as coincidence. Because when I graduated Cornell in 1973, approximately one out of 10 dogs got cancer and it was always a disease of the old. And now the latest statistic is approximately one out of every 1.61 dogs in the United States will get cancer. We must look at what is cancer. Does it actually exist as an entity, something out there that attacks the body? No. What is the relationship to the immune system and cancer? And what I always use to explain this simplistically is the embryonic analogy or similarity to cancer. So in the next slide, we all start life as two cells that become one. The sperm penetrates the egg, called fertilization, and it forms a one-cell individual called the zygote. Then the zygote splits into two cells, two cells into four, four into eight, and then you go on and on, and you have many, 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 probably millions of cells that go through different stages. Then we have a miracle of nature called cell or cellular differentiation, where a stem cell, remember these zygotes, these blastocells, they're all the same cells, and then all of a sudden, 
Nature knows how to create muscle cells out of the same stem cell, intestinal cells, eyeballs, heart, brain. It's a miracle of nature. Cancer is, very simplistically stated, a lack of proper cell differentiation. So cells that are going to become normal bone because of an immunological foul-up become bone tumor cancer. Cells that become that are supposed to become normal brain all of a sudden turn into a brain tumor. On a very simplistic level, it's not more complicated than that. So why does this happen? What are the important factors that cause immune suppression leading to cancer? What suppresses the immune system? In my 45-year experience, there are three significant influences to that. Number one, vaccinations. I am not anti-vaccination. It's just the way that we've come to establish protocols of vaccinations in veterinary medicine become immune suppressive. Calling dogs and cats into veterinary offices every single year or every three years for all of their puppy or kitten vaccines and the fact that there is no dose to weight relationship for vaccines where the two pound chihuahua is receiving the same dose as the 140 pound Great Dane and medically proven that dose that the Great Dane gets could be up to 10 times what it needs. We need to have a more scientific view of vaccinations because there are scientific studies done at the university level that show the immune suppressive effects of improper vaccination. Diet. Not going to get too much into diet because other presentations are going to cover that well. Just a little touch upon it. And unfortunately, genetics. We've made so many mistakes in healthcare for so many decades that on the genetic line, we do see commonly young dogs, even down to three months of age, with terminal cancer. So they're born either with a tumor or the predisposition to rapidly form a tumor. Very simplistically, very briefly, who created pet food? the basic foundation of modern day pet food. Where did it come from? So the most common food, I think in the history of the pet food industry, Purina. Not to bad mouth Purina, but Purina, they created Purina dog chow. And remember the famous Ralston checkerboard square? Ralston Purina. The company Ralston, what do they make? What did they make? They made wheat, wheat checks, rice checks, and corn checks. So the basic foundation of the pet food industry stems back to the cereal industry. And there it is, Ralston Purina. I actually found a slide that dates back to 1902. Ralston Purina cereals. That gave rise to Ralston Purina dog chow. So just as one example, the ingredient list of one of the more common foods, Benefil. Look at the first ingredient, ground yellow corn, chicken byproduct meal, not whole, whole meat. The third ingredient, corn gluten meal. The fourth ingredient, wheat. Dogs in nature did not eat at bakeries. So why I put this up here is Look at the mouth structure of a dog and especially a cat. Show me one tooth in a dog or cat's mouth flat for grinding cereal. It was not what nature intended them to eat. And very importantly, Dr. Greg Ogilvy, who was the head of internal medicine and oncology at Colorado State University for quite a while, he proved scientifically that the byproducts of grain or cereal metabolism in the dog's body, which is glucose and lactate, supplied the growth to cancer cells. So we don't want to go in that direction, even though, unfortunately, we have. This is a copy of a book that one of my employees gave to me as a gift that she bought for $1 at a garage sale many years ago. 
and it is a medical textbook from NYU Human Medical College from the late 1890s. I opened it up, and look what their drugs were back then. Next page. Look at that. Now let's go into modern-day medical therapy. These are three common antibiotics, doxycycline, Batril, and amoxicillin. Why are they these colors? Do you think your dog or cat cares what the color of these things are? And are these colors free of side effects? No, they have toxic effects. So my life's work is trying to get back to more natural therapies, therapies that have been on this planet for thousands of years, and talk about supplements. Supplements. What are they or what should they be? Are they needed by our pets, even if our pets are healthy, and why? They're concentrated foods or should be concentrated foods. They should compensate for deficiencies created in the food chain over the adulteration that has occurred in modern day era of the commercial pet food industry. And yes, they are needed even if animals are healthy because unfortunately, I don't consider almost any animal being born healthy anymore because of what we've done with the earth and what we've done through the pet food industry and why the incidence of cancer has at least quadrupled within my professional career alone. And my clinic, which sees pets from all over the United States and different parts of the world, we have every patient in my clinic on supplements. So once again, to recap what a supplement is, it's a concentrated food to make up for the deficiencies in the food chain. Supplements supplement the diet, not so much the patient. They supplement the patient indirectly by supplementing the diet. In reference to cancer, some basic rules or important facts when it comes to treating cancer patients. Cancer is an emaciating disease. When you see a patient, a human patient, that died of cancer in the coffin, what do they look like? Fat, heavy, robust? No, they're emaciated. So with cancer, even though we want to go more towards what nature intended them to eat, species-appropriate diet, any food is better than no food in a cancer patient so they don't emaciate. And you've heard the old saying, you are what you eat. I don't quite agree with that 100%. No, your pets, they are what they metabolize. Take a car that's out of tune, try to make it run better by putting in the finest quality gasoline. It's not going to work until the mechanic tunes up that engine. Supplements viewed as foods help the body metabolize food better. So they are concentrated foods compensating for deficiencies to enhance not only the health of your dog or cat, but also to enhance the way the body metabolizes the food you are feeding. So just some examples of supplements that have become very common that we've used in my clinic for decades. Essential fatty acids, very, very important. They're building blocks for fats and oils, and their key importance is inflammation and immune support. And we need the proper balance of omega-6 and omega-3 fatty acids because the omega-3s are the ones that are anti-inflammatory, anti-allergen, immune support. The omega-6, when in too high concentration, actually create inflammation. And the two best sources of uh, these omega oils are fish and krill oils. And also, coconut oil is getting a lot of positive review for being beneficial, especially to dogs. The dosing for these omega-3-based oils in a cancer patient, in an allergy patient, is a lot higher than just maintenance. And you could start at 1,000 milligrams, even for small dogs, and go way up. We like, with a cancer patient or a severe allergy patient, go up to what's called bowel tolerance, where you keep on increasing slowly the dose day by day of the oil you give until their stool gets a little loose and then you back off. The more you give, the better off it is. Digestive enzymes, very 
very important. I consider them a food because without them, food is not properly utilized by the body. It's not broken down. Your dog or cat can eat the finest food in the world, but if the digestive enzymes created by the pancreas, by the stomach, and in the lining of the intestine, if they're not properly breaking down the food, it's not going to be properly absorbed and utilized. There are also digestive enzymes called proteolytic enzymes. And it was this was a theory that was uh, brought forth by a dentist, Dr. William Donald Kelly, where he was using high levels of digestive enzymes, especially proteolytic enzymes, to successfully break down cancer cells in humans. And in my practice, we started to use these enzymes decades ago, and we actually saw a positive effect in shrinking or breaking down tumors. Herbs, they've been around for thousands of years. They are highly medicinal. I personally feel the closest thing to a drug without the side effects of a drug in natural medicine are the herbs. They are not only anti-inflammatory, anti-allergy, immune supportive, some herbs can actually help break down cancer. Aloe vera, something we probably take for granted, has tremendous nutritional effects for the body. They're high in amino acids, improved digestion, speeds up intestinal detoxification. They're anti-inflammatory, especially when used topically for burns, for allergies, for rashes. I always and have always recommend every household should have at least one aloe vera plant growing in there for not only themselves, but for our human parents of our pets. And there are certain aspects of aloe vera that do have scientifically proven anti-cancer components. And something very, very big and very accepted right now are the medicinal mushrooms. And there are many of them. Here's just a list of the ones that are immune supportive, antioxidant, anti cancer, lion's mane, shiitake, reishi, cordyceps, coriolis. When we work in our practice, we do a lot based on the individual patient's blood results. And we do a lot of work and have for, for decades with what are called glandular supplements glandular liver, glandular thyroid, glandular pancreas. And it has worked so well, especially when you consider in nature, dogs and cats, carnivores, when they killed their prey to eat, they ate all the organs. So we now remember a supplement is a concentrated food. We'll use concentrated glandulars to help reestablish health and metabolic function. And lastly, just to show you something that just made me so happy after my 45 years of trying to bring forth the benefits of alternative medicine, this is a study done at the University of Pennsylvania Veterinary College that showed that the turkey tail mushroom, when used to treat one of the worst cancers in the dogs called hemangiosarcoma, had up to a five-fold increase in longevity for a dog than the use of chemotherapy. Thank you for listening today and in best health for your dog and your cat.